I'm with Kevin Raber, Thomas Knoll, and I'm Michael Reichman, and we are on the good ship True North uh, on the Kimberley coast of Western Australia in what I just checked is the officially the Indian Ocean, which is kind of weird to be in the Indian Ocean in Australia. But here we are, and we're on the last day of a POTUS workshop uh, for phase one, and uh, it's been a lot of fun. And uh, we're here to talk about uh, several things, but Kevin, why don't you take it? Because you had some opening thoughts. Well, one, one of my opening thoughts, I suppose, is mm -hmm. uh, Thomas Knoll was kind enough to give us a presentation last night on the history of Photoshop, which was actually quite fascinating to actually know where the roots of a program that affects almost every photographer in the world actually originated from. And uh, Thomas was going to share a little bit about the history of Photoshop uh, with us, and then we have a few other questions for Thomas, so maybe we should just kick it off into uh, the history and... Okay. Um, it's essentially the story of... Uh, I, I was uh, a f raised in a family with three boys, and I'm the eldest boy, uh, and uh, my the middle son was John, who was my partner in Photoshop, and then we had Peter, who was the youngest. and. Uh, Peter is actually not part of the story, unfortunately. <laughs> <laughs> Poor Peter. <laughs> I'm sure he's a nice guy. <laughs> he, he, he does some very interesting things with his life, but, but uh, not related to Photoshop. John um, sort of figured out what he wanted to do with his life very early on. And uh, that started pr pretty dramatically in, uh, I believe, 1977, when he was 14 years old, and the movie Star Wars came out, the very first Star Wars. And uh, John saw that movie five or six times that summer. So bad. <laughs> <laughs> and he's basically decided that's what he wants to do for a living. So he wanted to. Uh, he wanted. He wanted to be Luke Skywalker. No, he wanted to make special effects for movies like Star Wars. That's more realistic. Yes, and uh, he sp uh, spent a lot of time in our in our family basement. Uh, building models of various uh, spaceships and creatures, and mm -hmm. he had little rubber molds and, and, and fake eyeballs on these, <laughs> these one-eyed creatures. Yeah. And uh, did a, a, at one time he built a, a model house, and he was very interested in sort of filming the explosion of this house. So he, he got some like firecrackers or something to, to blow it up, and he got a eight millimeter movie camera that he could run at a very high frame rate to slow things down and make it look more in scale. Mm -hmm. But the problem was everywhere he looked on the ground, uh, he was unable to find uh, a place, a view that didn't have bigger objects in the same scene. So mm -hmm. you have a house with a 500-foot five, tree behind it or something <laughs> like that. So it, it threw off the scale. So the only place he could figure out that, that he could actually film this explosion was on the roof of our, uh, my, my parents' house. So apparently he, craw he crawled up there. I was not around at the time, fortunately. Uh, he, at, at the very peak of the roof, set up his thing, set up the camera, filmed the explosion. <laughs> you couldn't see any, any of the uh, uh, objects that would break the illusion of scale. So. Mm -hmm. And a career was born. <laughs> so he was, he was filming special effects explosions already when he was, <laughs> was, was still in high school. And he decided he wanted to go to uh, USC film school and uh, you know, sort of managed to talk, talk his way into some visual effects studios uh, in the Los Angeles area. Uh, he went out with my dad one time uh, for a, uh, my dad went to a conference in Los Angeles and he sort of talked his way uh, visiting some visual effects studios. And uh, when they were, when he was doing the preliminary work on a phone, they had no idea that he was uh, uh, like a junior in high school at the time. They thought he was some college student looking for an internship or something. But he, he managed to get in there and find out a lot of information and, and sort of impress the people involved. So he had a lot of encouragement and uh, he went to film school. Uh, you know, taught himself uh, motion control camera technology and actually built mm -hmm. some equipment to do that and uh, rent and actually did some commercial work using that homemade motion control camera that he, that he built. And he used those skills when he graduated to get a job at Industrial Light and Magic uh, as a motion control camera operator uh, wow. straight out of college. Was, was <laughs> then and still is <laughs> Which one is, of the but, great places. And, and this is the visual effects house that did the Star Wars movies. Sure. So he, 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 was, he was working at the exact same company that he saw made this wonderful movie that he inspired him to go into this. And so he uh, has really prospered there. And uh, as of 
uh, a couple weeks ago, they announced his promotion to chief creative officer, wow. which is a, sort of like a co-president. Right. So this is a, a really big deal for him. That's so a big deal. Wow. <laughs> he has uh, like actually did exactly what he decided to do. Uh, I'm a little different, or at least I thought I was a little different, but it turns out I was probably a lot very similar. <laughs> When I was a kid, I had a, a hobby of photography. I started out with a rangefinder camera, and, and my dad taught me how to develop film and make, make, make prints in the dark room. And I you know, learned black and white printing technology and color printing technology a little later. I did some TV chrome prints. Uh, and I was always frustrated in the dark room, sort of uh, how difficult it was to, to, to control the things you want to on a print. Because mm -hmm. when you make a black and white print, you want to have your your the bright areas come out white, but you don't want them burned out, and you want the, the, the dark areas to come out uh, near black, but not, not plugged. And uh, you don't really have that, that knob in, in the dark room anywhere. You have a knob that controls sort of like the midtones and sort of raises everything up, and then you have a separate knob with either variable contrast paper or developing time or, or something like that. Time, <laughs> temperature, dilution. <laughs> yes. Right. And you can select stretch the range, but it doesn't. But it also moves the midpoint a little bit. But so you see, everything's changing in the wrong way. But you really want as a knob that you can grab and say, "This is my whites. I want my whites right here, mm -hmm. and I want my blacks right here." So I'd always sort of. I, I did little tables of. of uh, I did some experiments with, with with various exposures in the dark room, very and various uh, contrast papers, and, and sort of try to figure out the math for, for doing the plots. To, mm -hmm. So I so I could actually you know move the points independently by by varying two parameters at once. Oh. So uh, actually used some of that uh, knowledge when I, when I started designing some of the features of Photoshop because I, I tried to figure out a better way of doing that now that we have digital technology and we're able to do things with a single knob that does exactly what you want to do rather than two knobs that you have to sort of fight mm -hmm. the crosstalk on. Uh, the other sort of hobby I had, which is related to Photoshop, is uh, when I was a freshman in, in uh, High school, our, our, our high school had uh, three uh, teletype terminals, and uh, I believe two of those were connected to a time sharing computer that we could, uh, uh, you first you would type up your uh, little basic program uh, on the, on the uh, offline teletype, and it would punch out uh, <laughs> on paper tape the, the actual program, and then yep. uh, when you, you, you got your chance to go to the, uh, com the computer that was online, you could upload the program and then run it and get a printout on, a, on the teletype machine. I actually really loved this process, so I you know, spent most of my afternoons there writing little programs, mm -hmm. and uh, got pretty good at it, and uh, then uh, the, the math teacher at, at the, here in high school in Ann Arbor uh, you know, talked to the uh, uh, local community college and, and got access to, for the high school students, to the uh, community college's computers. And, and they were like fancier things and they actually had like CRT screens and stuff like that. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> <but again. laughs> so you could actually, actually see some of the, the when, you, when you typed in, you actually see it on the screen, which is right. pretty, uh, uh, pretty revolutionary. Um, so I kept them going back and forth there. And uh, uh, there's a local company called Manufacturing Data Systems Incorporated in town. And uh, uh, I, I got hired by this company because the uh, president um, uh, decided sort of for, uh, uh, I don't know exactly what motivated him to do this, but he, he went to the math teacher at high school and sort of asked for the, the uh, the, the best computer programmer they, they had at <laughs> school. Cheap labor is what it's called. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and so, um, you know, he, I got hired as a you know uh, when I was in eleventh grade of, of high school uh, as a you know a part time programmer, and mm -hmm. I, and I worked pretty close to half time on that all during the school year, and then uh, when summers came, I worked sort of uh, forty hour weeks during the summer, mm -hmm. and I continued working for them all the way through under my undergraduate degree. And I, all the time I was in undergraduate school at, at the University of Michigan, I didn't take a computer class. So, it was on the so, job training. Yes, so I'm uh, completely self-taught in computer programming. Mm -hmm. so. Where do the stories of John and Thomas <laughs> come together? Uh, that happened sort of while I was in graduate school. I continued on for my, uh, working on a PhD at the University of Michigan. And uh, the field of study I, I went into was computer vision. Mm -hmm. 
which is uh, somewhat related to image processing, which is what Photoshop is. Uh, image processing is uh, taking some input image, doing some manipulation on it, and producing an output image. So it's changing an image to another image. Right. Uh, computer vision is uh, uh, taking an image and sort of producing under, understanding that image. So you, so you look into the image and you, and you understand the objects and the, the spatial relationship and the identity of objects in, in the, uh, in the uh, image. And uh, the, the problem I was working on was uh, trying to figure out um, uh, how to recognize objects when they were partially obscured. So the, the, the classic problem at the time was a robot has a bin of parts, and the parts are all stacked in randomly because the, the, they, they come in. Mm -hmm. And the robot has to pick out the part and has to be able to recognize the parts even if they're, if they're partially overlapping and they're and they self-overlapping. So it has to be able to figure out where to grab it. And Content to where grab. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> and so um, I, I, you know, I was working on this problem, and you know, I had some uh, trying to efficiently do this, this this without sort of like doing an exhaustive search of every possible place where a part could be. And uh, you know, one of the tasks I had to do for that was like find the edges in, in this image. So I wrote some little uh, image processing algorithms that would take an image and produce uh, find the edges. And uh, like one of those algorithms is a, a classic image processing algorithm called the Sobel Edge Detector. Mm -hmm. And that is still in Photoshop today as the find edges filter. Okay. <laughs> so that was sort of the first <laughs> filter that I wrote. Right. And uh, I wrote a bunch of these little tools. You know, simultaneously, my brother was doing his day job at Industrial Light and Magic as a motion control camera operator, and uh, you know he had you know, you know taught himself model making and then taught himself motion control technology, and he sort of decided the next big big thing in uh, uh, special effects for movies was uh, digital image processing or, uh, or com uh, computer mm -hmm. graphics. He was doing optically, you know, by phot photographing multiple pieces of film that they would right. have to like stack up and print yep. and, 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 and <coughs> you, you, there was limitations in, in, in how much quality you would lose every time you, you added another thing to a scene. My, my brother started writing little uh, computer programs to do computer graphics and it's it really basic, really basic stuff like uh, render a sphere on a checkerboard and sort of all the classic things people do to learn how to do ray tracing algorithms. Mm -hmm. uh, and he, he wanted to run this on his Macintosh computer. And he, uh, at the time, d simply just displaying an image on a Macintosh required quite a bit of programming skill because you had to uh, understand all the operating system calls to uh, display an image. Plus the uh, like graphics displays were pretty limited at that time. Uh, I, I owned a Macintosh Plus at the time, which had a black and white display. Mm -hmm. and, and when I say black and white, I mean black or white. Yes. It, 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 it didn't have any gray. <laughs> what, what time frame? This was uh, in 1987. 87, right. And uh, at that time, this was just as the very first, uh, uh, like the Macintosh 2 was starting to come out, yep. and uh, uh, which actually had an 8-bit display. He, however, he was like trying to render, you know, color image, 24-bit color images. So uh, you would also have to write special code to to approximate that 24-bit color image on an 8-bit color display. So uh, I had I had all those routines written mm -hmm. as a little tool. So I gave him a copy of all my tools, and uh, he found them very useful and he could like do things. But he sort of asked, it's it's kind of inconvenient to run these as, as tools. I'd rather just have a little application so that's a, uh, it's, it's, it's a one thing I can drop mm -hmm. in and then just like uh, directly open the files and show them to people and stuff like that. So I packaged up basically all the tools that I had, like the display routines, uh, the, 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 fo the file format translation routines, uh, the uh, like the Sobel Edge Detector routine, and, and that sort of built it all into one little application. And I called that application Display because its primarily purpose was like read a files in, display. Mm -hmm. It could save it in a couple of different formats, and it could do really simple manipulation on the image. But it was basically, well, the, dis the, the, the name describes it. You weren't able to do that much manipulation. No, it basically had almost no image processing capabilities right. at the time. Okay. Which didn't last long because sure. uh, my brother sort of 
uh, doesn't take no for an answer. <laughs> hey, Tom, why can't we do? Like why can't goal. we do this? Why can't we do that? <laughs> so he would always come back and 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 sort of have a new feature, and I, uh, often he would make a suggestion, and I say, oh, that really doesn't uh, you know wouldn't work. But I would sort of mull on it for a week a week or so, and say, oh, I could if I do it this way, it'd actually be. It would fit in with everything else, and it would actually be pretty easy, and it would make a lot of sense, and it would, act, it would work, work better than you know, his initial proposal, but it would accomplish everything that he that he suggested. So uh, th that went back and forth a whole lot of times, so where, where he he was essentially requesting the functionality, and I was trying to figure out how to provide that functionality in a way that sort of fit uh, with all the rest but of the But at this point, you were doing this for him. Was there thought in the back of your mind at, this, at that point that maybe this was a product? Uh, not at the time, because uh, in, in, re in reality, uh, I was working on a PhD at the University of Michigan, and I had completed most of the research for that PhD. And so I had uh, my experiments done, which were involved, you know, writing, you know, computer code and, and taking images uh, with the cameras we had at the time and stuff like that. So I had uh, done all done all the fun stuff. And what was left was actually writing the uh, uh, this very long paper I have to write. I know it's <laughs> so not fun stuff. The program well, was the fun stuff. It's yeah. the paper that was the killer. Yeah, well, at least for yeah. me, I, I really uh, dislike writing uh, papers, mm -hmm. academic papers or creative writing mm -hmm. or anything like that. That's not my strong point. <laughs> mm -hmm. So I'd much rather you know procrastinate and sort of you know work on writing this computer program. Mm -hmm. It became a whole lot of fun because the, the, every time I added a feature, it would become yet more powerful, so it would be even more fun. And, and, and the, you could think of the next thing to add and stuff like that. And, and, and at some point, my brother said, you know, we could sell this thing. You know, this, everybody I showed this to, you know, really loves it and says we, sh we, should, we should do this. So, mm -hmm. uh, you know, he had, he had looked in the, uh, found out the ad rates of Macworld Magazine to put a little uh, classified ad in the back and right. uh, decided that, you know, uh, uh, we really couldn't, didn't have the resources to, 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 to market an application because it would require a pretty substantial investment to, you know, start a new company from scratch. Sure. So he asked if he, if I would mind if he would like show it around to some publishers and try to get some interest going. And I said, uh, sure, you know, but you know it's it's, it's going to be uh, a pretty massive job to you know convert this even partially done application into something that that would that, be a, a commercial quality shippable application. So, and he said, ah, well, you can do it. So, <laughs> <laughs> so he, he showed it around to a lot of people and. Uh, uh, we showed it to some companies, and one of the companies we showed to uh, sort of went bankrupt on us before they could actually sign the deal. So, <laughs> and some of the companies did not want to see the demo because they said they had something similar they're working on internally. That they didn't want to contaminate their engineers. Uh, but we came to uh, you know find Adobe, and uh, you know had a handshake agreement in, in uh, uh, September of 1988, and then uh, we had a, uh, we had the basic terms negotiated already by that time. But then you have to write the legal contract and, and all the little clauses involved. And uh, uh, that took until April of the next year, in 89, right. before they actually, uh, all the lawyers were happy with the wording back so and forth. Speaking of wording, how did you come up with Photoshop? <laughs> <laughs> well, they uh, started as display. It started as display. And then uh, we added, we're adding all these image processing features. So uh, we decided, you know, uh, display doesn't really make any sense here. And uh, we, all we, you know, we figured eventually when we found the publisher, we, we that they would um, uh, go through this extensive survey of you know marketing analysis and stuff like that, and they would find the real name. So we we're essentially picking a code name uh, for this product. Uh, so uh, the first code name that that I sort of invented was Image Pro for Image Processor. Right. And uh, we we had that a while, and John started doing some demos, and then heard that uh, I believe IBM for some mainframe or something like that had some product called Image Pro. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so so that, that, that name was sort of used in the marketplace already. Uh, so the next name we came up with was Photolab. And uh, John was doing another demo, I believe, uh, at uh, the company that made the Amiga uh, computer. Yep. And uh, after he finished his demo, they sort of went in the back room and brought out a box that said Deluxe Photo uh, uh -oh. <laughs> it was the product they were working on. Uh, then one time I was giving a demo to another company because uh, they wanted to show me some technology they had. 
it turned out that you know my technology was a lot more interesting than, than their technology. But uh, the, the the big thing that we got from this meeting was uh, I was sort of explained how we had tried Image Pro and that was used, and and Photo Lab and that was used. Uh, and so they said, well, have you, have you thought of Photoshop? And I said, hey, that might work. you mind if I use that? And they said, oh, sure. <laughs> so there, that, that's where it started. So what was, what was Adobe's product line like then? Do you remember? Well, Adobe was founded, uh, their, their first big product was PostScript, which was the, uh, yeah, the typesetting. Right. Yes. Yeah. It, it was a language that they embedded in printers. Right. And uh, it would, you would send basically a computer program in a language called PostScript. They licensed this to Apple and they included a PostScript interpreter right. in the, inside the, the first laser uh, writer. The laser they, writer. Uh, sort remember of, that box? God, and they were expensive. <laughs> oh, they were outrageous. Yeah. And, and this was, you know, the, the, the Macintosh, the laser writer, and uh, PageMaker from all this were sort of the beginning of the... Uh, uh, Desktop publishing. Yes. It, you know, it, it, created, it created a yeah. whole, whole industry there. Changed everything. And uh, uh, shortly thereafter, uh, uh, Adobe uh, released Illustrator, mm -hmm. you know, which was a, a line drawing program based on PostScript, the, the, the math inside PostScript. So you had the same kind of Bezier curves, which mm -hmm. were sort of built into PostScript, and, and it was designed... To, to, you know, to create PostScript that would, you, you could print out. So you, you had uh, uh, a very good you know, page layout program, uh, PageMaker, and you had uh, a line drawing program. And sort of the third piece was a you know, good image processor. Graphics, right. And uh, the, there wasn't one on the market. And Adobe had PostScript, and they had Illustrator, and they were a very lo uh, logical company to, to, to sell the, the uh, sure. third piece in this. So, so your original deal with them was a licensing deal. Yes, uh, you know they, they would pay us some royalty mm -hmm. out, of, uh, out of the revenue of Photoshop, and uh, in, in return we would continue to work on the program. And how long did that last? Uh, that lasted a, until about '95 or so, in which and w at which point Adobe sort of got tired of paying me royalties <laughs> and uh, you know, bought John and myself out for, mm -hmm. for a lump sum uh, piece of my. Uh, well, so at the time, up until say around '95, you weren't really an employee. Well, I was actually I, 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 I was not an employee until uh, earlier this year. Actually. Someone told me <laughs> that or, 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 they, they said Tom's know, gone to work at, <laughs> at, at Adobe. You know what? They finally hired him. <laughs> yeah, I, I've, I've been employed just over a year now. So, <laughs> well, I don't know whether to say Mazel Tov or not. <laughs> <It's> like, <laughs> John and I formed this little company called Knoll Software, and we licensed mm -hmm. this to Adobe. So I had it all set up that way on my taxes, and uh, I sort of, I sort of really enjoyed um, uh, not having to uh, uh, you know, report vacation hours and and, and, right. and and all the kind of stuff, and all, all, all and to go through performance reviews as part of an employee. So, so I so I sort of just maintained that status as a, a independent contractor. And even after they, uh, you know, purchased the full rights to Photoshop, you know, they would pay me a yearly fee for uh, my services as consulting on it. And I, mm -hmm. I, I continued that up until uh, very early last year, and when they being um, 2012. Uh, 2012. Then I transitioned to actually being a full-time employee. Okay. Uh, what? Oh, wait, wait, wait. <laughs> what motivated that? <laughs> what motivated that? Uh, uh, well, 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 one of the motivations was health insurance because I had moved to California. Hey, that's a good reason. <laughs> and I needed to uh, get a, a California health insurance company because I can't keep in health insurance from Michigan and live in right. California as my, as my residency changed. So right. uh, that was just one of the, the factors involved. And uh, other was uh, uh, I wanted to be a little more involved in some of the um, uh, executive planning decisions mm -hmm. uh, of, of, you know, how Photoshop is sold and, and, and priced and, and such like that. So, so well, what's your title? Sorry, I was going to say, what's your title? Uh, my title is Fellow. Okay. Oh, which cool is <laughs> Fellow but means, to, in my way of thinking, is you basically do what you want. <laughs> uh, it, it's, it's the title that Adobe gives to the people at the top of the technical ch uh, cha uh, hierarchy. Right. And uh, they have a management hierarchy, and that you know tops out at the CEO, and they're, they're primarily involved at uh, you know beyond a certain level. That that chain is, is sort of involved in managing people, and so and, and projects and stuff like that. And uh, I, I I wanted to manage technology. Somewhere along the line, you actually switched from Photoshop into a, an Adobe Camera Raw, and eventually into you know uh, writing the software for Lightroom. Is that, yeah. Uh, where did that kind of transition into? Yeah. You know, when I um, 
uh, you know, bought a digital camera. I actually bought a Canon D60 back in uh, 2002 when it came out. And I wanted to you know, use the RAW format inside that camera. And I was not particularly impressed by the software that uh, Canon was shipping with that. And I thought I could do a, a better job than that. And there had been this sort of long-term feature request uh, uh, from Adobe uh, users to add a, a RAW format support to Photoshop. So uh, I had this camera with a RAW format, and I thought it was kind of an interesting project. So uh, one of the perks of, of, of you know being very senior on the Photoshop team is I get to pick what I want to, <laughs> uh, which feature I want to work with. So I, I volunteered to work on this feature. So I went off and uh, essentially wrote the first version of Camera Raw. The Camera Raw project was part of the Photoshop team. It was just a little, uh, but it's it sort of grown over the years, and, and now there's sort of like a separate Camera Raw engineering team, which which I'm sort of the, the leader of. We still you know, sh you know provide the plugin to Photoshop, so we're still sort of considered part of the Photoshop organization uh, because of that. But uh, the Camera Raw plugin, you know, the image processing part of the Camera Raw plugin, is also used as part of Adobe Lightroom, which is a, a application that was really designed at the photography market because it uh, can process many images because with the digital age uh, photographers instead of like picking their best image and scanning it and loading it in Photoshop and spending lots of time on that and printing it out uh, they, they get a digital camera and they download their card and they have hundreds of images to go through so you really need a system that can deal with a lot of images so Lightroom provides a, a cataloging where, and you know, very, very useful tools for synchronizing adjustments between mm -hmm. multiple images. But it, 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 Lightroom has a develop module, which is used to modify images. And that develop module uses the image processing code that's from Lightroom. So they're both the same in that, in that sense, yeah, but one uh, sits inside yeah, Lightroom. Yeah, so uh, I, I wrote the, uh, you know, the first version uh, of the image processing code that, Light, that Lightroom is using, and, and the Lightroom team wrote the user interface that goes on top of that. So they, they, they control the little slide, they, they draw the little sliders, and then they tell my code uh, to, to what happens to that image when, when, that, when you adjust that slider, and then, uh, then I give them, give them the resulting it image back. It seems like you're always adding a new <laughs> slider, Thomas. <laughs> Yeah, so uh, we've been, you know, growing the, the, the camera plug-in and Lightroom sort of in parallel for the, uh, and I've been working on that for the last uh, uh, 11 years now, so. Is it leveling out or do you still see uh, a uh, lot of features for it? Well, we, we still, we're still adding features at about the same rate, so it's, wow. it, it's, got, it's got a long future ahead of it. Excellent. It's been interesting to watch the evolution of Lightroom, because I remember we were uh, together in China uh, at one point on a workshop and you told me about this secret project <laughs> that turned out to be Lightroom and I got involved as a, yeah. an alpha tester and a beta tester and I I now live in Lightroom you know it's yes. my <laughs> sort of burned into my brain and fingers uh, there's still features I don't know but yeah. like it's like Photoshop you know yeah. nobody can know it all um, but what interests me is and one of the questions here on this workshop that we've been doing this last week uh, a lot of people say to me uh, do I still need Photoshop? And uh, I'm, you know, I'm using Lightroom, or I'm using um, uh, Phase One's Capture One software, or, or maybe they're using Aperture. Uh, you know, where does Photoshop fit in to the typical photographer's workflow? Is it still necessary? Um, for for depends on the style of photographer you are, and if you're a very uh, straight out of the camera. Uh, do minimal adjustments and print it out type photographer, you know, Lightroom is perfectly adequate for that. Mm -hmm. uh, there, there will always be a limit as to how far we, we can go in Lightroom in terms of doing very creative things. And, right. Well, uh, we don't have layers. You don't have layers, and so uh, Lightroom doesn't do composites. So, so right. uh, if, you, if you if you want to take multiple images and, and overlay them, and you want to put this part from this image into this part, that, that, that's that's really where Photoshop excels because it's it's been evolving for the last sure. uh, twenty three years uh, doing. But exactly that's more that. photographic illustration than it is pure photography. Well, you can, you can debate one way or the other whether you know, uh, <laughs> and, and you know right, right now if you want, if you, if you want to like re, uh, erase something from an image. And photographers right. do this all the time. They have beer cans what? and power lines. What? <laughs> <laughs> and How dare they? <laughs> and 
uh, you know, Lightroom's, you know, uh, starting with Lightroom 5, we can do a, you know, a much better job on these kind of things. Mm -hmm. But uh, at, at some point, you know, Photoshop does a better job of that. Oh, Photoshop yeah. No, there's no question that, yeah. you know, it's there for a lot of people. But, um, you know, there is almost uh, a naivety to the yeah. question yeah. Uh, that uh, some photographers ask because they feel uncertain. Because for 20 plus years, Photoshop has been uh, the program that, mm -hmm. I mean, the name itself it yeah. tells you what it is. But um, Lightroom, you know, they go, well, can I do without Photoshop? And it's almost like, you know, will, will I be making a mistake? And mm -hmm. what I say to them is, if you don't miss the features, if you're just being a, a photographer doing basic photographic manipulations, maybe Photoshop isn't something that you need to necessarily have. Um, a very individual process, but I'm sure there are many more copies of Photoshop out there than there are Lightroom. Uh, yes, it, it, it's a, a, a very massively distributed program, uh, mostly legally, or, or mo uh, mostly, mostly legally, actually. Mostly illegal, unfortunately, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, but it, 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 there, there are a lot of copies out there, and it, it, it will do basically anything you want it to. Right, well, particularly it, it, with Camera Raw. Yeah as being part of it. And that's something I think, you know, if, can I be a little critical of Adobe? Uh, and maybe of you. I don't know the role that you played in it. There is so much confusion about camera raw, bridge, Photoshop, and someone will say, well, I process my raw files in Photoshop. And I say, in camera raw. And they say, what's camera raw? And it's almost like they don't understand that these are separate entities. They're plugged together they work mm -hmm. as a unit, uh, and then I say, well, but you know, Camera Raw is really the same raw processing engine as, as in Lightroom, and they say, no. And, and <laughs> I, I think the explanation to you know, the typical user can sometimes uh, it, it be a little confusing. Any thoughts? Yes, it can be confusing. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let's move along now. Let's move along to something that is, has been controversial, and that is in this first quarter of, first half, shall we say, of, uh, of 2013, uh, Adobe uh, announced that uh, Photoshop, as well as the rest of the creative suite, uh, are moving to the cloud. Uh, and I guess maybe another way of saying that is they're moving from a perpetual license to a subscription model. And a lot of the community responded very positively and said, that's great. And there are some real pros to it, uh, among them that you always have the latest and greatest. And uh, uh, But a lot of people have looked at it and said, well, gee, I don't want Adobe sucking dollar bills out of my wallet every month from now until forever. And what happens if I lose my job and I can no longer afford to, do I lose my pictures? Um, there are a lot of people who are who have been upset. Now, where are we today? What where, where do we stand? Where do photographers stand in terms of the whole issue of perpetual license versus uh, the subscription model? Well, this has been a uh, controversial subject within Adobe also, and uh, you know I first heard about uh, th th this plan last October in one of the executive meetings. Which I get, uh, but uh, in terms of, of widespread knowledge within Adobe, most people didn't know, find about this till sometime this year, and uh, the exact pricing of all all the arrangements was not revealed to us until fairly recently in terms of stuff. And uh, I expressed some of my concerns that uh, for the photography segment in particular, you know, uh, the offerings that Adobe initially came out with on, on, on the Creative Cloud uh, were sort of not sort of targeted at them. Uh, uh, there, there was, for photographers, there's not a whole lot of value added by the cloud features yet. Uh, we're, we're certainly working on a lot of stuff in the lab and there's really some really exciting stuff happening uh, regarding uh, Photoshop and Lightroom and, and the cloud and, deal, and you know, all, all the interactions in there. Uh, but you know, as of right now, uh, there's there's not a whole whole lot of value added by the, the cloud features, mm. uh, so uh, you know people look at this. You, you have purchased Photoshop perhaps a long time ago and are buying upgrades. You know, often very regularly or skipping a version. I usually skip a version. Okay. Yeah. Uh, 
You can certainly afford to upgrade every time. I can afford to upgrade every time. There isn't, because I, no, well, let's be serious. Um, yeah, I can afford to upda update every 18 months. Uh, and I don't resent giving the money to Adobe. I just don't often feel that there's a compelling need. Yes. Um, there, are, there isn't that much that's, oh, wow, I've got to have that. Uh, usually by 36 months, then it's, okay, I'm falling behind the curve, and then I'll go out and, uh, yeah, and do the upgrade. It seems what they try to do is release something with some magic button. You know, like, I think uh, CS6 was the content aware. And you know, to me, that was worth the upgrade alone. Mm -hmm. But um, you know, some of us have to justify exactly what these uh, new features are and whether they really relate to the work we do on a daily basis. So, mm -hmm. yeah, um, and, and this is this has sort of been the uh, fundamental problem with the uh, sell a perpetual license and then sell upgrades model is that uh, we're sort of driven to do whiz bang features that demo well. Mm -hmm. And so you know, the engineers are, are sort of pressured by marketing. Well, we have, we, we have this release coming up and we need to you know, sell the upgrades for this right. release because we need to actually make revenue because we're a, a, a public corporation and we have shareholders and we have a duty to those shareholders to, mm -hmm. you know, to make the, the, a profit. Yeah. Uh, so uh, we, we, and the way we, make a, we made a profit in the past was by encouraging people to buy upgrades. And so we sort of design features that look well, you know, demo well, and, and, and say, oh, I need to have the copy because of the, that wonderful new whiz -bang feature. Mm -hmm. And uh, a lot of the times what people really value in a product is, is the stuff that uh, sort of doesn't make the top 10 feature list of a release. And, and uh, there's been an effort at Adobe in recent years, and the, the phrase we use is just do it, uh, JDIs, where we, uh, sort of respond to a feature request that's been long pending. It's not not like uh, you know you know changing uh, uh, exactly how some often used command works in in a way that actually you know makes it a little easier to use or uh, adding a, sh a shortcut uh, to, to a, so some complicated operation that makes it makes it uh, faster to use. And, sure. and so if you know the emphasis is now on selling a subscription, so you know, there's no big buy-in cost anymore. Right. And you sort of always have the, the uh, current uh, release. So uh, the software will go basically go out and download updates as needed. Yeah, yeah. well, the user has its control. Yeah. So, right. so will there be the whiz bang kind of things coming out? Oh, uh, uh, you know, yeah, obviously we still have to do the whiz bang things, but uh, we'll pro probably be more emphasis on doing things that actually, uh, you know, the, the goal is not to sell an upgrade anymore, it's to keep people subscribing now. Right. Okay. And so the people are subscribed if they're happy with the product and they find it essential to their workflow and, and very useful. So, so, so the features we, we are, we, we're going to be concentrating now as engineers on are more things that, that improve the usability of the product. Uh, often, you know, you, you, simple, you, you make some complicated features simpler and, and, and you, or you spend time on optimizing the speed of some operation. So uh, you know, it works faster, and so people get their work done faster, and they're happier in the end, and then they're less frustrated. Uh, so uh, the, sort of the emphasis is more aligned with, with, with keeping users happy that are using the product, which is a good thing for the users, because we're not concentrating on doing things that uh, may show well in a demo, but, but not be that really useful in reality, because uh, now our users are all, um, actually using the real product and, they're, and, and, and they're, they're finding out for themselves whether it's useful in their workflow. So, but you know, you're saying keep the users happy, but this announcement has made a lot of users unhappy. Yes, uh, and, and there, there, there have been a number of, of reasons why they're unhappy. And uh, probably the biggest uh, uh, reason is, uh, you know, the, the people who use a, a whole lot of Adobe products, you know, the, 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 that have been purchasers of the uh, Creative Suite in the past, are actually uh, generally pretty happy with the announcement because uh, the the pricing is uh, 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 pretty reasonable on a month-to-month -month basis mm -hmm. for buying the you know all the Adobe apps right. and, and there's a lot of Adobe apps and and mm -hmm. use a, a three or four of them uh, regularly. Uh, it's actually a pretty good bargain. Uh, it's uh, less of a good deal for the photography community, which basically only use Photoshop or maybe Photoshop and Lightroom. 
And uh, if, if you're subscribing on to only to a single single application uh, in the system, uh, the you know the pricing is you know 40 percent or so of the uh, price of doing you know all right. the Adobe apps. And if you, uh, you know, the the cost of that worked out to be substantially more than uh, uh, you know buying upgrades er er every time a, a version came out. Mm -hmm. So there's probably no question that the, the cloud idea is a great idea, but. Because well, there, there there are other objections to it, but uh, uh, you know, in, in terms of you know, you know being, providing you know, services to our to our users, uh, it gives us the engineers a lot of freedom, and we can also constant we can, we can also take advantage of the cloud because that's sort of where the future is anyway. So uh, we can start adding more and more cloud-based features, you know, real cloud, you know, syncing between computers, uh, uh, integration with mobile devices and stuff like that that, that, that are really not possible with, without a uh, well, yeah, you know, I think some of that's pretty, online component. Pretty exciting, but if you're a photographer and don't want Illustrator, or you don't want, you know, uh, some of the other uh, suites that are in there. What's what is the the, the or what kind of solutions can we look at, or what, do we just say we're going with it or mm -hmm. we're not? You know, there there have been meetings that I've been involved in amongst the uh, uh, higher ups at Adobe. Uh, to figure out a way to uh, sort of address a lot of the, the photography market's concerns. And uh, we, we realized that, you know, uh, selling, uh, uh, you know, perpetual updates to Lightroom and uh, uh, subscription update to Photoshop and sort of combining all that, you know, the math doesn't work out right now. Correct. So we're, we're, we're looking at a sort of dramatically different pricing structure for uh, some bundle or some combination of Lightroom and Photoshop that uh, could be a, a lot more attractive to f photography users. A, a subscription system means that uh, you don't have to wait for a whole upgrade cycle before we can get a feature out. If a right. feature is ready from the engineering level, we can ship it right away. And the Camera Raw team is, you know, has features in, in the uh, pipeline for you know, version 8.1 and 8.2, and we're going to be shipping you know, real functional upgrades That's great. All, all through the cycle. But there is one constituency, a very small one, that is not going to be happy about this. Well, yeah, that's you know who that is. <laughs> Product book writers and video training <laughs> producers, because where where's the demarcation? <laughs> you know, you no longer we're no longer going to have fixed models on a fixed schedule. And what do we do? Well, you probably do the same thing that Adobe's doing, <laughs> <laughs> and you you uh, you know your training modules. You know, as a new feature comes out, you need to like update that section of the video. Right. Okay. So we're going to move to the subscription model. Yes. <coughs> what about books? Uh, it's going to make training manuals a little yeah, more difficult to produce. Well, yeah, the you know, we haven't figured out exactly what you know you know what the future holds, and, right? And and and, and how we come up with sort of major release milestones and stuff like that so mm -hmm. so, so uh, you know book writers and such can identify yeah uh, cuz yeah, it's which, almost which like <laughs> the frustration uh, this year well late last year early this year Leica brought out the M it's yeah. no longer M8 M9 M10 it's yeah. the M and as a writer writing about this it makes me crazy mm -hmm. because what M am I talking about yes. and when they bring out the next one is it also going to be the M? Mm -hmm. They say yes. Well, look, Porsche 911. Mm -hmm. It's a 911. Whether it's a 1982 911 or a mm -hmm. 2013 911, I go, no, it's not the same. <laughs> yeah, you're not going to be identifying, you know, version numbers per se. Uh, uh, well, you know, each of the apps has, has, does have a version number, so, so mm -hmm. you, uh, okay. you know. Uh, but but it's a good thing because it'll just be Photoshop. Yes. That's it. It's Photoshop. No more version numbers. Because everyone, theoretically, mm -hmm. well, I don't know whether you might do voted version numbers, but theoretically, everyone will be up uh, to the latest. Yes. And so that's a good thing. Yeah. You said something uh, a little while ago in regards to uh, you know, trying to address the photography segment market, and uh, it sounds very much like you've been an advocate for this market. Um, uh, you, me, and Michael are pretty much the same thing. We're enthusiast, uh, advanced amateurs, or whatever title you want to stamp on us. Um, so you've come up with a concept to put what Lightroom and Photoshop some way into a bundle at a, at a, a different subscription price. Yes, and and sort of yeah, Lightroom is Adobe's you know best photography centric uh, uh, product, and we really, if you're a photographer and you're not using Lightroom, you're really missing out on a lot of the value that Adobe provides. Mm -hmm. 
uh, uh, photographers tend to use uh, Photoshop on a minority of their images, but, but it's uh, essential for those images. So uh, they, they, they really, uh, Lightroom and Photoshop uh, go together really well. And so you do the majority of your work what you can in Lightroom, and then you do your detail, you know, unusual shot, uh, composite type operations in Photoshop. So the combination of, of Lightroom and Photoshop is sort of the, we believe, the uh, perfect uh, photography solution. And uh, you know, there's a lot of debate within uh, Adobe management as to whether it makes sense to do a special deal for photographers. Uh, to combine these two products into a, a, a single subscription at a very attractive price that if you do the math actually works out to be cheaper than keeping both of those updated in the past. Actually a very exciting product because uh, it looks like we can price this to the point where we can attract a whole lot of new users into the Photoshop community and the Lightroom community and have a really uh, exciting time coming. So oh, for, that's great. for like all that. the noise on the forms and everything it sounds like Adobe you know put their ear to the rail and Listen very yeah. well, well there. Yeah, yeah, that's really good yeah, to hear. Yeah, it's nice to hear from somebody inside Adobe too. Thank you, <laughs> thank you for standing up for all of us. Guys. Okay. Yeah, and thank you for this opportunity to uh, hear a little bit about history of uh, you and John, and you know where Photoshop came from. For a lot of people, uh, Adobe and Photoshop are just this anonymous. Uh, corporate entity and, and program and uh, I think it's fun to know they're yeah. real people with yeah. real stories. A lot of heart know. and soul in this product. And, and, and for the uh, camera raw team, uh, sort of a uh, there are now four engineers on it and uh, a prerequisite of hiring anybody is they actually have to have a love of photography. So, uh, wow, so that's we, great. And we, we eat our own dog food as, as <laughs> say, so. well, you know, We've had a hell of a good time uh, photographing together for the last week and an amazing area. Um, yes. So yeah. it's been all real good, and it's been great sitting down with you. Thank Thanks, you. Fascinating. Tom. Thank you.